Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Beyond Resilience. My name is Sabah Fulayan. My pronouns are she and they. I am a filmmaker and also the interim director of Firelight Media's Documentary Lab. So thank you again for joining us for the special Beyond Resilience event set during Black History Month, which focuses on Black filmmakers, Black narratives, and Black life in America on screen today. In just a moment, I'll introduce you to our two phenomenal panelists, Elegance Bratton and Jatavia Gary, who happen to be friends of mine as well, a privilege that I hold very dear. Um, but before we dive in, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous history and land rights and to express our intention to stand in solidarity with indigenous people. The Firelight offices are located in Harlem on the land of the Munsee Lenape. We all have a responsibility to consider what it means to acknowledge the history and legacy of colonialism and genocide. I encourage you to make land acknowledgements in the chat and our chat moderator will drop a link to help you learn whose ancestral lands you live on. I also wanna thank Open Society Foundation for its support of the Beyond Resilience series. Beyond Resilience is also supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and New York City Council, the National Endowment for the Arts and Field of Vision. And thank you to the Firelighters, our gen generous community of individual donors whose support directly benefits our growing family of filmmakers. We are currently in the midst of our spring fundraising campaign and seeking charitable contributions to support our mission of changing the story. To make a donation in support of our work, please text Firelight to 44321. I'm thrilled for today's Black and Now panel discussion with two filmmakers who have brought their personal stories and sometimes their physical selves into their works. Elegance Bratton is an award-winning award and boundary-breaking director, writer, and producer. He began making films as a US Marine after spending a decade homeless. His work captures stories untold with an intention to show the universal power of our shared humanity. He was recently named one of Variety's 10 directors to watch for 2023. In 2021, Bratton's critically acclaimed feature documentary, Peer Kids, on which I incidentally was a collaborator, just had to big that up, you should add that to your bio, uh, won the Independent Spirit Awards Truer Than Fiction Award. It's really a beautiful and, and unique and immersive film for those of you who haven't seen it. And his most recently, his semi-autobiographical narrative fiction debut, The Inspection, world premiered as the opening night film of the Toronto International Film Festival and garnered numerous award nominations, including from the Golden Globes, the Gothams, and Film Independent Spirit Awards. It centers around a young homeless gay man who joins the Marine Corps to win back his mother's love, but learn, learns how to respect himself at boot camp. Some have said it's the career defining role of Gabrielle Union. Um, I encourage you to check it out, formulate your own opinion. Um, it's a really, really beautiful film. And our other illustrious guest, Jatavia Gary, is a filmmaker and multidisciplinary artist working across documentary, avant-garde video, art, sculpture, installation, and performance. She is deeply concerned with rememory and employs a rigorous objectivity and neutrality in nonfiction storytelling by asserting a black feminist subjectivity and applies what scholar and cultural critic Bell Hooks terms an oppositional gaze as both maker and critical spectator of moving image works. Jatavia has exhibited at the Hammer Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, and MoMA PS1, among other spaces, and has received generous support from the Ford Foundation, Cine Reach, Sundance, Documentary Institute, and Field of Vision. Gary has received fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Creative Capital, Field of Vision, and Firelight Media, and is a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow. So, you know, to make a long story short, these two are not playing. These are two 
very, very serious and very, very successful artists. And we all know that that is really no small feat um, in a world like ours. So before we dive much deeper, um, I want to get folks thinking, we're going to look at some work, some samples, and I want to get folks thinking about the approach to form. And we're going to talk about just the expansive range that's embodied um, by both of your work. So let's look at the inspection trailer. Have you ever been a homosexual? No, sir! I will break you. I promise. Are you in trouble? No, I need my birth certificate. I need you to help me. I'm gonna be a Marine. <laughs> Marines. No, you ain't scarier than two left shoes, and everybody can see it. And more than 50 have been wounded or injured in this attack, including several American servicemen who were on patrol there. This all I have left of the dream I held for you. Real question is, why do you want to be here? I want to be a Marine. That's not good enough. To be a good Marine means to know thyself and seek self-improvement. That means you, give it. Aye, sir! They kicked you out, didn't they? My mom, she won't even talk to me. Most of my friends are dead or in jail. If I die in this uniform, I'm a hero. Somebody. Who camp is supposed to break you down? I want to go home. If we leave, they win. Why is this weapon your best friend recruit? Because it's the thing that protects the Marine to my left and to my right, sir. I could have left you at any doorstep. I am never giving up on us. So as you can see, extremely compelling work. I brought up Gabrielle Union, but I feel like we also need to talk about Bokeem Woodbine's performance in this film. Um, you really did your thing. Um, so I'm really excited to dive in, but before we move on with this discussion, let's take a look at the trailer from Quiet As It's Kept, which just opened this month at the Paula Cooper Gallery in New York and is in Jatavia's words, a contemporary response to Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. I literally told you chicken eating bitches. The girls that get it, get it, and the girls that don't, don't. Obviously you don't get it, because you're not that girl. Got it? Here is the house, it's green and white. It has a red door, it is very pretty. Here is the family. Father, father, Dick and Jane live in the green and white house. They are very happy. See Jane, she has a red dress. She wants to play, who will play with Jane? See the cat, it goes meow, meow, come and play. Come and play with Jane, the kitten will not play. See mother, mother's very nice, mother. Will you play with Jane? Mother laughs. Laugh, mother laugh. See father, he is big and strong. Father, will you play with Jane? Father is smiling, smile, father smile. See the dog, bow, wow, goes the dog. Do you want to play? Do you want to play with Jane? See the dog run, run dog, run. Look, look, here comes a friend. The friend will play with Jane. They will play a good game. Play, Jane, play.
beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I haven't yet had the privilege of seeing it in person, but um, just watching the live stream from the Paula Cooper premiere, I was totally engrossed. Um, so yeah. let's dive into this discussion. I have been looking forward to this all week. Um, really, really excited to be here with you all. I mean, people were, you know, messaging me about this Beyond the Re Resilience. I like snuck back onto Instagram for two seconds and I had messages about this discussion. So it just feels like such a privilege and it feels like living my little girl dreams of, you uh -huh. know, Black literati and having intellectual conversations. So let's talk about the form. Let's talk about the form because, you know, I think as Black artists, there are so many you know, not so subtle expectations and requirements and hoops that we have to jump through. And one of them is the idea that, you know, either we don't have the talent and the mastery of a sort of a Hollywood traditional way of storytelling or that our stories are not commercial. And I think Elegance, mm -hmm. the inspection, um, disproves both of those and then more. So can you talk about, how were you thinking about form? How were you thinking about, positioning yourself as a Black storyteller in relationship to that conversation? Well, um, it's interesting you bring up the kind of line between Hollywood and I guess the alternative would be just, I guess, just pure personal expression versus like expressing within the context of a particular industry. And I think, you know, the journey I've been on with all of my work, you know, from my short fiction films to my doc series, My House, to Pure Kids, you know, I've been trying to, it's tough because it's like on one end, I love Hollywood cinema. I'm a fan of Hollywood cinema, classic Hollywood cinema, problematic Hollywood cinema. These are some of the movies that really have inspired me and influenced how I think about using the camera. So when you talk about building craft, I have my own internal dialogue about where I'm going when it comes to, you know, using the language of cinema to express myself in the most authentic way, but also to position myself career-wise in the most advantageous way. So, um, you know, I think that when it comes down to it, the I have what I call cinematic dyslexia and that I don't really see a difference between documentary and fiction film. I view them as two divergent paths towards the same outcome, which is ultimately a movie. And in, in my documentary work, you know, you can spend 12 hours, like here kids, I would spend sometimes 12, 18 hours a day with the participants in that film. And, and I, I think it's another thing too, for me, like, you know, the form and the actor, the person who's in the documentary participant, everybody's participating with my vision and changing that vision and adding their two cents to that vision, even when it seems like it's a Hollywood thing, right? But ultimately what I've been kind of trying to do is to chase the truth and express the truth and find ways to um, elevate our experience as Black people, as Black queer people especially. Um, but in terms of form, you know, I, I it's hard for me to separate my, my influences from the things that I make and the goals that I have for these things, you know, all of it is kind of like, it's like pulling apart a grilled cheese. So for, at the end of the day, what I'm, what I'm hoping to do with this film, which is autobiographical in a sense, um, is to really focus on emotional impact and use the tools of cinema to express that versus any sort of like kind of adherence to like any notion of fact or chronology or anything of that nature. It's more so about, you know, what have I been through? What did I learn from it? And I always tell people my movie is, the inspection is a thousand percent autobiographical when it comes to the characters' hopes, fears, and desires, the lead character. But when it, you know, comes to the relationship between him and his mother, all of that is out of my life. But even that stuff, like if you, anybody who's been in a relationship long enough knows, you can have the same argument with someone for 10 years, you know? So what you're watching in my film is kind of like a, a condensation and like, you know, things that were said 10 years apart are kind of smashed together within the context of the the structure of the storytelling in order to create an emotional response, which I hope, you know, makes it clear that, you know, Black queer folks are essential and absolutely deserve to be the stars of their own movies. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, the film is certainly extremely effective um, on that yeah. level. 
So just Javier, I would love for you to respond to anything that Elegance has said, as well as, you know, just talk about this idea of taking this oppositional lens and yet, you know, there's a way in which your work asserts itself as being central. It's not necessarily designed to just be watched off quietly, you know, in a small art house, although it is wonderful to consume in that way. It is really uh, a negotiating things that are central that have to do with daily life. So talk about how you see yourself in relationship to form. Yeah, I think for me, in many ways, historically, I have been kind of like positioned in opposition to what one might call the industry or, you know, the kind of traditional filmmaking form. But for me, it's 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 less so about, you know, it's less so about opposition. It's more so about a kind of inventiveness and asserting a new cinematic language. I am equally inspired by Hollywood in the past. You know, I grew up on Hollywood. I grew up on TV. I grew up in the 90s. Um, and so there's a number of works and films that stand out to me as pivotal. Um, but then, you know, during my studies and during the early stages of my practice, I was exposed to works that were completely, you know, genre defying, category defying, um, works that basically exploded the possibilities for me and allowed me to realize, allowed me to see that when it comes to cinema, anything is possible. Um, and so for me, it really is about asserting something that has not necessarily come about before, even if elements or components of it are familiar, right? Like, for example, I study documentary filmmaking. So in all of my films, which I consider to be experimental documentaries uh, or art films, as some people say, right? Um, or experimental films, as some people say, um, there is a, a documentary element to it, right? If you look at something like what we just saw, Quiet As It's Kept, there's of course montage, there's a dance uh, segment at the very end, but threaded throughout the film is an interview right, a talking head, which is kind of basic 101 documentary filmmaking, right? And, and the same can be said for the Givigny document, which is a work that I made in 2019, which played at both festivals and a space like a gallery or a museum in a three channel iteration. Throughout that film, you have a kind of on the street, Vox Populi, you know, a woman engaging myself, engaging with people on the street and asking them questions. Well, this is this kind of like foundational documentary convention. So I guess for me, there are elements to traditional filmmaking that I continue to, I guess, cleave to or continue to, you know, employ. All at the same time, attempting to push the boundaries of what the narrative can look like. And much like elegance, I don't draw very strong distinctions between you know, a nonfiction film or a fiction film, right? There's always this kind of element of performance throughout all of the work, things that are seemingly staged, right? So, you know, to me, it's really kind of, I'm, I'm because I'm an interdisciplinary artist, I'm looking at this through a kind of conceptual lens. What, is, what are the best tools? What is the best shape? And what are the best conventions that I need to use in order to get this idea across, in order to tell this story? But I, I just wanted to jump in. I think it's interesting because it's like, to me, film, cinema, by definition, is an inter interdisciplinary art form, right? So it's just wild to me that, you know, people act like, wait, like, I mean, you're brilliant and your brilliance makes it hard for a lot of people to just get it right away because it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's just ahead of its time. But at the same time, yeah. it's not so out of the ordinary to call, like film is actually an interdisciplinary art form. There is, you are being a filmmaker in the truest sense of the word by by calling that out, right? Because it's not it's not just set, a shot, set up a shot. I mean, maybe for some people it's just set up a shot, but I know for the best, it is a combination of things. Mm -hmm. I think when you're thinking about the tradition, or sometimes the way that folks are taught, or sometimes how things might go down on big budget sets, things are kind of regimented and stratified and kind of hierarchical. And that's why sometimes people in their minds, they separate the fact that this is perhaps the most collaborative art form, 
right? And and unless we're talking about some sort of music making situation where we've got like 50 people on stage, right? But like, you know, filmmaking requires writing. It requires uh, the music. It requires visualizing. So that we're taking the photo or setting up the shot or, you know, it's just so many different levels to the actual process that you're absolutely right. It's completely interdisciplinary. Um, I'm wondering, you know, because I see more and more filmmakers who want to approach the documentary form through an experimental style. I see more and more filmmakers who see the who see the form agnostically, like you said, elegance that I'm a storyteller and I, you know, myself included, mm-hmm. tell stories in this mode or that mode. Um, as a filmmaker who has recently gotten to sort of peer behind the curtain of artist support, you know, how does how does one then judge the sort of correctness or the value or the the you know sort of um excellence how do you know when you've reached where you're trying to go in terms of what the idea is if you're rejecting the notions that have been handed to you and if you're moving outside of these boundaries what how do you create your standards and how should other people sort of understand how to judge stories, how to compare stories, how to see the value of stories, if not by these narrow sort of uh, uh, rules that we're used to. Mm-hmm. For me, it's uh, it's really simple. When I'm pitching a movie, if I notice that someone is kind of not engaged in what I'm saying, then I feel like the story is not working. Um, and to me, it's it's very much audience driven, right? I I have a thematic kind of intention to everything that I do. And I'm trying to use, or rather, I'm using the the camera and the actors and the you know the lighting. And when it's in that space, when it's in a documentary, it's slightly different. But all that to say, it's the audience for me. Like even when I'm uh, workshopping my films and I'm at that point of like you know test screenings, I always have a screening where I literally I'm hidden and I watch the audience watch the movie, and I'm watching them kind of go through the process and that's in on my docs and my fiction films i'm watching them go through the process there's this great book called in the blink of an eye by uh, edward merch where he talks about you know basically it's not anything new the cinema is the language of dreams and if you've ever you know shared a bet been lucky enough to share a bet with someone for a long time you can tell when someone's having a nightmare by how they blink you can tell that someone's having a good dream by how they breathe and so on. same thing can be said i think when watching people watch movies and when I see them kind of blinking in ways that like, the rhythm is off, like they're struggling with it, you know, I'm, I'm asking myself, is that struggle something that I want them to do in this moment? And if so, great. And if it's not something I want them to do, then I'm kind of reevaluating it, you know, but it really, again, it's like the processes are so kind of married to me, like even in, in the inspection, like the, yes, it's a fiction film, but, you know, we had, we shot on a real, um, well, we shot on the police academy, which was built by a Marine who finished boot camp in 1987 and I, in Paris Island, South Carolina, which is where I went to boot camp in 2005. So this, uh, this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Tuggle, he built, his, his whole police academy is built as his emotional memory of Paris Island, just like my script is the emotional memory of Paris Island. And I was able to fold my actors into real training, you know, not necessarily actual Marine Corps training, although we had a great military consultant come in, uh, I'll tell you, Jones, who just got off of the drill instructor field. So all that to say, they were fully immersed in a Marine Corps experience, even though it was a fictional film. It got to the point where my lead actor, Jeremy, would be like, you know, I'm an actor. Like, I don't have to actually do push-ups. I can just pretend to do them. And I'm like, no, you need to feel this in your body. And, 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 and I'm grateful that Jeremy trusted me in that. So, you know, I don't, for me, it's, 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 but audience, when I say audience, I'm also talking about my collaborators as well. Like when I'm, and this is where it can get murky, especially as a person of color and a queer person, what have you, black person, because I find myself in environments where most of the people I'm working with, maybe not necessarily in the creative on the ground, but in terms of the financing and the approvals are not like me at all. So I'm, very much of the mindset that everybody is the director of their particular function for the film. So I open myself up to them as an audience as well. If my actors aren't getting it and I'm having a hard time explaining it to them, then that means it's not working. 
So I need to find something else, you know? So I, I, I try to, I try to kind of simplify it for myself because it's just, otherwise it gets too esoteric and I'm not, it's just, I, I, I don't know. I, I grew up eating every bite of food on my plate. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know how to meander just yet. Hopefully in the future, that'll, that'll be a skill that I develop. <laughs> And how about you, just Javier? How do you know when you know when you're done with a piece that doesn't necessarily have a sort of clear precedent? Right, and, and and it really feels like none of them do. It feels like each film requires a new Jatavia, right? It requires me showing up in different ways. I think it's similar to what evidence elegance. I keep wanting to say evidence. evidence. That's the name. Evidence. It's the name of my upcoming <laughs> film, right? I love it. I love it. <laughs> I keep wanting. I keep wanting to say evidence. Elegance. I, it's it's very similar to what elegance is saying, um, and that the audience. Um, but it starts really with myself, and that I am the first audience member. Yes. Right. Because Good. the works are so personal. Because the works are so strange, we'll call them. Right. Because there is no precedent. It really is an instinctual process. You know, I'm working and I'm working and I'm working until I'm just kind of like. I think that's it. I, th I don't think we can continue to rework it. And then there's a process of kind of review, right? Where there are select people who get to watch it. Sometimes I'll invite people over to the space and they'll watch it really big on the projector. Other times I'm sending out links to people who, you know, whose eye I trust, whose sensibility I trust, who has who have a practice like myself or that varies from myself because I'm interested in, you know, a kind of, divergent idea, you know, not necessarily what I, what I might be expecting as a response. So it really is about how is it landing with my intended audience? Um, is it resonating with people that I am trying to speak directly to? And understanding that it's not going to necessarily resonate with everyone, right? Yes. I think in many regards for, when it comes to funding, when it comes for comes to school, you know, training, it was a lot of priority placed on this idea of universality. And I'm of the mindset of Morrison, Toni Morrison, when she says that to be universal, you've got to go very specific, right? And I don't know if everyone is caught on to that in terms of like the people who are making the approvals, right? The people who are, you know, cutting the check. But I think that that's an important note, right? For everyone, and I think most artists who are doing work in the world, who have, you know, managed to, you know, garner some level of success, they understand that, right? In order to, to touch everybody or in order to touch the, the greatest amount of people, I need to get very, very specific about what I'm doing. And that will in turn invoke something in someone, even if they don't necessarily understand exactly the, the lived experience that's presented on the screen to them, they understand a kind of basic level of connection and humanity. And, you know, that's something that I would really encourage, like, folks who are getting started, but also folks who are at the very, very top, right, to understand that if we're asking people to water things down, if we're asking people to kind of get to a kind of immediate universality, then there's a flattening that's happening, right? And I think that's something that historically has been an issue with the industry, um, but it it is hopefully changing, right, with the emergence of folks like Evidence and many, many others who are breaking into that space and kind of declaring um, their reality, their very specific reality central and asking everyone else to understand that, right? So I don't know. I think I think it really is about audience, but understanding that I am my first audience and that I, it is instinctual. It's coming from within. I would like to change my name to Evidence, if that's possible. I don't know. Did I this... say Evidence again? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that name. I'm going to name my son Evidence. My I have a son. film. I have a. I have a film coming. <laughs> I have a film that I've been working on for ten years. It's called The Evidence of Things Not Seen, and I right. simply call it Evidence all the time. Right. But your name is Elegance. Please charge it to my head and on my heart. No, nah, nah, it's all good. I like it. I like that name. I want to call. I want. <laughs> Album, my mixtape. I've been traveling. I've been traveling. I'm not all the way here. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruce. <laughs> Young Evidence. I think there's a few rappers who actually should be called that, but that's a good story. Uh, <laughs> so, Jatavia, I want you to continue because you're on a roll and I want to talk about, I want both of you to talk about this. One of the things that both uh, uh, Quiet As It's Kept and The Inspection do really well is you, you, 
infuse it with these gestures. And Jatavia, you you coined a term when we were in our, our prep call about this. You said algorithmic blackness. And it just really struck a chord with me. Did I? You did. You did. You did. You did. We got the evidence. Talking, Really? And it struck a chord though, because it really spoke to this, this deep anxiety, honestly, that I've been having that, you know, black voices are, you know, as big as they've been in a decade. And yet I don't feel any of the blackness that I'm familiar with. I maybe mm -hmm. some of it, but only the sort of respectable, integrated world facing elements of that blackness. And there are languages, there are rules of grammar, there are rules of cadence, there are rules of improvisation that are nowhere captured in the algorithm. And I think the same goes for being queer and the language of our self-expression. And I think mm -hmm. both of you embedded these really surprising, I think in the inspection, delightful, and I think in Quiet it's, as it's kept, you know, frankly, quite stirring. I, I didn't know what to feel at certain moments. Like, is she allowed to, you know, talk like, my auntie Nam inside this gallery in front of these white people. <laughs> this, ah, she allowed to do that? How am I supposed to feel about it? Like it really stirred <laughs> off of, you know, my, my, my center, my expectation. So can you talk about that specificity of gesture and the sort of language of the body and the tone and the, the kind of micro communications that you both wield so well in your work? I think just have it, you were, you were called out first. Well, thank you for that elegance. <laughs> I think that, um, I think the, so the film, one of the things that the film is about is language. You know, this is an interpretation, not an adaptation, but a kind of contemporary response as I'm calling it of the bluest eye. So it's a, in many ways about language, it's about literacy. Um, it's about the written word and it's about the spoken word. And all of those things are very specific again Right, those things have regional differences. They have generational differences. They have cultural variations. And so I was really trying to think through language through the assertions of Morrison, again, of Toni Morrison. So I was listening a lot to her Nobel Prize laureate lecture. So when she won the Nobel Prize, she gave this really stirring lecture and it's in the form of a narrative. She literally starts with once upon a time. And she's basically talking about the importance of language. And she makes these distinctions between dead language and living language. And she doesn't define a dead language as a language that's no longer spoken. She defines a dead language as um, a tool of power. Um, oftentimes a language that forecloses upon knowledge, a censoring and censored language, the language of despots, right? It's a place where power goes to hide uh, it's hand, uh, it's disabling and disabled. So, you know, she encourages us to think through what a living language might be. And so again, I wanted to think through some of the specificities of my own experience as a Southern black woman, right? The ways in which I would hear people talk and continue to hear people talk, the ways I express myself, the many ways I express myself, right? Whether we're talking about the kind of masking and code switching that one must do when they found, find themselves surrounded by people who do not look like them, um, but need to navigate the terrain in a kind of defensive posture. Um, and just like really wanting to consider again, what a new cinematic, like, like if we were to put cinema within this, this kind of quandary of dead or living language, you know, how can we make sure we're on the side of the living? How can we make sure that we're pushing, pushing, pushing and progressing and opening up the possibilities instead of again, closing that down. So, you know, I take risks and I take chances and sometimes they pay off, right? Sometimes that means that sure, we're gonna have a really big, beautiful, lovely show. That also means we may not have the same distribution opportunities that, you know, a film that is not dragging, you know, power in the same ways that this film does um, might have. But also, you know, these are shorter films, you know, the film, I have not to, yet to make a feature. Um, so these, I'm really proud of what we've been able to do by continuing to stand firm in our convictions, our creative convictions, um, and in some ways our political convictions because those things are intertwined. Um, but yeah, the work is about language. And so I just I just find that to be 
you know, just super, 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 super specific. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because I feel like I'm moving towards a rambling state. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never that. I mean, you know, in terms of gestural, I think, you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is the legacy, oh, I think about all the time is the legacy of slavery and how, um, you know, just the algorithmic blackness is totally informed by that experience. And I mm. truly do believe that, you know, bodies live cultural memory that you may not necessarily, it's the evidence of what's unseen. Like you may not necessarily have experienced the thing in your genetic line, but with the right environmental triggers, you can feel it, the impact of the mm. thing. Um, you know, so when it comes down to it, I just kind of feel like it's tough because I'm, again, I'm like, I, you're catching me at a moment in my career where I've, I have one foot in a practice where literally everything I made was with my credit card in my bedroom, me and my husband, mm -hmm. Chester, love Chester, shout out Chester. Shout love out you, Chester. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, and now I'm at a point where I'm bringing my ideas into the business business and I'm, and I'm fielding, I mean, and it's, and it's great. You know, I love being in this position. I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit, but when you talk about gestural blackness, right. Um, you know, it, it can be, and, and, and particularly what you said, Sabra, that really spoke to me is like not recognizing yourself or your people in the thing that's supposed to be about us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, it, it's a very complicated situation because you know, for my film, like, I, I remember I was reading, I'm not going to tell the critic's name, but there's this one critic. Yes, he was a white straight man. We love them. And he said that, what's the big deal? He learns how to respect himself. I've seen this movie a thousand times. And when I think mm. about the legacy of slavery, Black folks possessing themselves is literally the bedrock of every political movement in the United States history mm -hmm. from then until this very present day. The idea that even when we talk about the, the disenfranchisement of those who've been imprisoned, right, and they're not able to vote, they, are, they have less possession of themselves and their voice than the state does. And we've always been in this like strange dance between being full, like trying to assert our autonomy within an environment within which we're thought of as property, within which our experiences are thought of as like, in our, in our lives thought of through the lens of commodity, right? what are you worth to me? So therefore, when we get too specific and we get too authentic, then all of a sudden we start to suggest that we could live independently of that which oppresses us. And if we live independently of that which oppresses us, then that which oppresses us loses its whole state to power. So, mm -hmm. you know, so how does that manifest in my career? It's like, I find myself, you know, I always joke around like, you know, I got to put my Morgan Freeman hat on today. Because I, I don't want to put Malcolm X on, but Malcolm X hat on, you know what I'm saying? Put Malcolm X hat on, I'll put this whole thing up. I put my Morgan yeah. Freeman hat on, you know what I mean? Then there's, yeah. there's for education, you know? So I think, you know, so like when it comes to the inspection, like it was just interesting because, you know, Jeremy is a phenomenal, I mean, they're all phenomenal actors in this piece. Every single person that says a line and does a thing is a phenomenal actor in my film. I, 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 I hold no pull no punches about giving them their praises that being said having to explain at times to the various parties involved you know both you know that an expression a black expression that i understand right because i've seen mm -hmm. my mother make that face i've seen my cousin make that face having to explain that that is enough that the person doesn't have to give you his whole backstory the person doesn't have to you know, the character doesn't have to walk you through every single bit of trauma that they've been through that led them to that moment. We don't need to understand why or when the mother and the son stop speaking to each other in my film. We don't. We can just look at them, be their physicality around one another. Like, uh, for instance, an opening scene, like I grew up, my mom, you know, I grew up, when you grow up in an abusive household, you just think that everybody grows up like that until you start to get out of the world and you're like, oh, wait. Everybody's mm -hmm. mom's out of order. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't even know it was morning until I got cable. That what my that's what I grew up with. So when you watch the opening of the film and he comes to his mother's house to get his birth certificate, 
walking through the home is an experience of physical abuse. And I definitely had multiple conversations with multiple, you know, and, and even before the movie's greenlit and all of that, with different types of producers who are like, why don't you give us a flashback of the abuse? And I'm just kind of like mm-hmm. watching him walk through that space and react to mm-hmm. the obstacles of his mother's psyche to me t- tells me everything I need to know about what happened before and gives me a lot of anticipation about what's going to come next. And having to have that conversation in, a, in, a, in an industry that is just ignorant to the vast range of reactions that Black folks have. They're just not, it's just not their culture and it's not in their, I'll end this on this where I start rambling, right? Um, one of my favorite uh, art critics or art cultural critics is Theodore Adorno, who in the 1930s was a part of the situation in school. And he writes this essay that I often return back to. It's called Little Shop Girl Goes to the Movies. And it's really about how, because the film industry is, at, for the most part, it, it, and thank God for people like Jatavia who push against this, it has mostly had been an exploit of the 1%. These cameras were never invented to liberate Black people. In fact, they were invented to codify and make permanent in the public imagination our subordinated position within this social structure for all time. It was never, nobody's intention was ever for black folks to hold cameras and to tell their own stories, right? And in in this essay, he talks about how the movie's job is to convince the little shop girl, the girl who's working at, you know, Rainbow or Strawberry, that one day a prince is gonna come into her job, see that she's special, offer her a ring and make her rich overnight. And how that in and of itself is why the medium is a means of control to someone like Theodore Adorno, you know, that the medium, like, I mean, it's not new, you know, Gil Scott Heron said the revolution will not be televised. It's kind of the same thing. It's only maybe 70 years prior to Gil Scott saying that, you know? So when you talk about that algorithmic reckless and like the authenticity, I'm grateful that I had collaborators like A24. I'm grateful that I had a collaborator like Game Changer. I'm even more grateful that I had a relationship with my producer, who's my husband. And I was able to have somebody in my life say, you know what? That scene does make sense and they're wrong. And I don't know how many black creators get that type of feedback. And I think that's why, some of this stuff is starting to, I'm not going to call any shows out, but I've been watching some things on streamers that's supposed to be authentic, you know, black urban experiences. And I'm like, who are these people? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Who is this? I think I will say you're right that they're kind there feels like there's kind of constant uh, need to translate things, even in like, even in the arena that I'm operating in, which is also very elite which is also very white, right? Right. Which is also um, a domain of the 1%. There does feel a need to kind of like, you know, one of the reasons that I would tell my friends, oh, you know, Hollywood is cool and maybe maybe we'll play around there one day, but right now there's nobody, there's no overseer, I would say. There's nobody Mm -hmm. over my shoulder telling me, "Uh, don't you think you should put this in? No one ever, nothing, never, right? But there is, well, explain this. Well, what does that mean? There is this kind of need of a constant translation, you know? And I think that that is something that Black people have have had to deal with for, you know, <laughs> centuries. And who knows how long we'll have to continue to deal with, right? But again, to go back to Morrison, what we're doing, what we're making is not necessarily for the person over the shoulder, right? We're trying yeah. to speak directly to But I have to convince that person it's for them. That's that's where my brain that, gets And that's the guy, right? <laughs> 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 therein lies therein lies the rub, you know, therein lies the rub. So also just I think an offering to all of the well-meaning sort of allies and gatekeepers who, you know, we've heard the frustration of how do we play our role. And I think that it's, you know, A, trusting Black creatives, trusting that we know what we're doing, trusting that we know how to speak to our communities, trusting that Mm -hmm. our most specific expression of ourselves is the most widest reaching version of our storytelling, whether or not you personally understand it. you know, and then just, I think, educating 
themselves and I think educating themselves in an interdisciplinary way. And that's the shade. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sabah, because you 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 were about to like drop a gem. Please hold on to that thought. But I just want to say nobody asked Wes Anderson these questions. Like I I I watch these esoteric white indie films, even the mainstream films, and people do things that seem completely just you can't do that. That's mm -hmm. not a permissible. Mm -hmm. And nobody is saying like, hey man, do you think these characters need to be so twee? I don't know a mother who talks to that. If my son talked to me like that, I would do a, nobody says that to them. But yeah. when we do it, it's like, now come on. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you just triggered it. <laughs> Please continue. That's exactly, that's exactly the point. You know, the, that trust the work that we have to make and trust that, you know, we are artists and you know, trust in our visions. And I think both of your work is proof positive of what happens, you know, when either you carve out that lane, mm -hmm. you know, like it's resistance, or, you know, when you choose to, to practice in a way where you don't necessarily have that overseer. Mm -hmm. We have a little over, a, about 15 minutes left. And uh, I had another question for you all, and we have about a half dozen questions from the audience here. So yeah. try to be as concise as you can and just whip through these so that we can let our audience get questions in. But the last kind of big topic that I want to bring up before we move to the audience Q&A is how you both show up in the work, how you process your presence in the work, how you maintain your mental health, Talk about being your own subject. Wow. Um, I'm still in the process of figuring out how to maintain my mental health. I didn't grow up. I grew up watching my mother work. She'd be sick. She'd be sad. She'd be heartbroken. And she would get up and she would work those 60 to 80 hours a week. And don't let me ask her what's wrong at the wrong time. Because she's like, I don't have time to talk about what's wrong. I need to make sure that this food is paid for, that school is paid for, these clothes are paid for. So that's how I grew up. So I have to constantly, I guess what the answer is, I have to stop myself and acknowledge when I'm feeling things and take the time to feel them. And that is something that I'm constantly working on. And at times it can be a little scary for me because like, I feel like I have to be so strong to get through everything. And I don't ever want to admit to myself that I might be struggling. But then the shit blows up in my face later. <laughs> so I had to figure it out. So I, I don't have an answer other than to just check in with yourself when you when you feel like we are taught. We Again, we've been accustomed to working through misery in this country mm -hmm. and not getting anything in return for it and having to show up and smile through it so we don't get killed and our children don't get killed. That's in us. So you have to be conscious of that type of colonialism in your brain and actively seek to dismantle it. And that's something that'll be a lifelong project for me. Um, and in terms of how I show up in my work, I just feel like as a black filmmaker in Hollywood, I don't know how to do this job without being famous in some way. I don't, I, every director I know of that is doing something that I look at and I'm like, oh, I wanna do that. Like their name in their own right, outside of their films, people show up to see Tyler Perry. And then they watch the movie, they show up to see Spike Lee and then they watch the movie. And I think that's definitely a response to Hollywood because it's like you, you, you get to a space where you get so kind of ingrained with not being enough. You're like, okay, now I'm going to be undeniable. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I feel like I kind of, even when I'm not writing about my life, I have to be very present in the work in a way that I don't know if white directors necessarily have to, have to deal with. Interesting. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, just about the extra labor that's always entailed and the way that your story kind of is almost compulsory companion, mm. whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, and it always struck me as kind of a way of liberal society doing this, you know, progress check on how well their, their measures are working, you know what I mean? And always looking for someone that they can prop up as an example of, you know, how things aren't so bad. I think that there's a real danger in having to constantly be exceptional. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about rooting for everybody Black, I mean, everybody Black. I mean, you, you know, maybe making work that I don't think is, you know, the most amazing. I think that they should still have jobs. I think they should unscripted and daytime TV and soap operas and all of those. Yes. 
Um, just Javier, I would pass the same question to you. Being in the work, how do you wrap your head around it and your heart? Yeah, I, I, I feel like I grew up and having watched the film, I feel like I grew up similarly, not the same, but similarly mm -hmm. to, uh, to elegance. Um, you know, watching my mother work, watching my mother toil and labor, um, and then, you know, just kind of a destabilized space, a destabilized childhood and home life. Um, and I agree that this kind of mental wellness, uh, this kind of healing, you, in, you mentioned an intergenerational trauma, you mentioned an intergenerational wound or an inheritance, that is a lifelong, you know, healing that, that journey is a lifelong endeavor. And so for me, it has become very central um, to my life. And I think it began when I started this autobiographical documentary, a memoir film, I'm calling it, something that I've been working on for about 10 years now, very slowly, um, kind of quietly in the background. Every once in a while, I'll pop out and say something about it. Maybe we'll get some funding and there'll be a little write up about it. But it's just kind of been kind of simmering on the back, slow cooking, you know? Um, but because this work is so demanding in terms of a self-reflexivity, a kind of looking at oneself and looking at one's family, it has, you know, quite boldly insisted that the inner life, the interiority, the psychological space and the physical wellness be central, right? It's It's highlighted a number of wounds, it's highlighted a number of, you know, past traumas. And so the therapy, um, the spiritual practice, I, I'm a practitioner of an African traditional spiritual practice, all of these things and the work itself, right? The actual creative practice, making things with your hands and including your body into it have all become absolutely integral, right? It's not simply to finish the film, but to right. live, to live, to be able to continue to make works, to be able to show up every day as my full self, as a, as a self-possessed, you know, Jatavia Gary, right? Um, and not someone who is spiraling. Um, because when I first began, there was always a kind of light to moderate spiral whenever something popped off, even if it was something good, right? Oh, you just, you just put up a show or, oh, you just traveled for your film. And now you're just kind of like having to reground and resituate yourself in your body because you're trying to keep up, right? You're trying to keep up with the demands of society and the demands of the economic system and the demands of your practice and all of the things that come with being, you know, quote unquote successful, right? The things that you should be happy about. So, you know, I've really learned to kind of put my wellness first, even before the practice, right? Oshun talks about caring for yourself so that you can show up for your work. So that has been a real kind of shift for me. And I think it began during the pandemic. Thank you, Javier. That was very, very well said. Um, I resonate so much with that sort of spiraling at each of the touch points because you're just, it's, it's just everything that you have to kind of keep moving from one step to the next. Um, so in our last five minutes, we're going to get to a couple mm -hmm. of audience questions. I'm going to read down two of them, and then I'll let each of you answer um, both as you, as you. Before you read, let's give Sabaha flowers. She's brilliant. Her work is amazing. Sabaha's incredible, we and we love, love, we love, love, love. <laughs> Yeah, okay, um, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is just such a pleasure and an honor. So one question we have from Sean is, what does refusal mean to you? And another question, which I think is very fun, um, are what are some of the landmark films that get it right? Ooh, uh, ooh okay, so ooh. refusal. I had a very good tip from a, a fairy godmother mentor. And she just, this woman is very much successful, multi-Oscar winner. Um, and amazing, amazing person. She gave me the best, one of the best bits of advice I've ever gotten. Don't ever enter a negotiation that you're not willing to say no to. Mm. Ever. Because people, especially in this industry, will smell that desperation on you and will work you to the nubs mm. and give you pennies 
because they sense that about you. So, you know, it, it never walk into a negotiation that you're not willing to walk away from. And ever since I heard that, I've been much, much, much better off in my career. I, I, I can't tell you it's night and day. And I've been applying that every every step of the way that the work, these the, the industry does not define me. I define me. I define what my work is about. I'm not going to anybody for any validation that I can't provide for myself first. So yeah, that 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 would be that. And in terms of just landmark works, love Paris is burning. I loved Who's Streets. I'm just gonna say it again. I love Who's Streets. Um, I loved uh I love anything where I get like I, my favorite kind of art is where I can feel the process in it a little bit. Because sometimes you feel the person who's doing it. Like I, I'm a big fan of um the artist Rembrandt. And I got a chance um like a few summers ago in Paris to spend a lot of time with his work. And I would just get so close to the paintings and like just watch the little brush strokes so I could get an idea like, well, this day he was really agitated. This day he was cool. He was calm, you know? So I like anything where the process is in inherent in the work, like Killer of Sheep by Charles Burnett is another movie that just constantly plays in my head. I'm always thinking about it. Um, yeah, but there's, I mean, that answer could literally be 20 minutes with me. So I'm gonna leave it like that for this, for this version of that answer. It's a question to ask a filmmaker, but we do it. <laughs> it is. I think Killer and Sheep is also probably top 10 for me. Uh, and I, I agree. I think if we can see, like I really love in my films, what I call showing the seams, yes. right? Not everything is kind of sewed up neat and tidy. Every once yes. in a while, you're going to see a little, you know, you're, and you're going to see my hand everywhere. And I like seeing that in film as well. Like if if you think about jazz, you know how all jazz musicians have their own style yes. and all rappers have their own style. I feel yes. like filmmakers, we need that too. Like yes. every filmmaker needs to have their own, you know, like early Spike Lee is very, very clear that this is Spike Lee. He's yes. got that signature Dolly shot. He's, you know, I think we need to be able to, and I think I, this is kind of something, a kind of what Arthur Jaffer was talking about in this, this idea of being able to bring this level of ingenuity this level of craft that we have in music to the visual space, like a kind of highly stylized, highly specific um, and, and experimental way of visualizing. I also really love Kathleen um, Collins's Losing Ground. Oh, and I yeah. love Ganja. You know, I really, I like, I like the, the, the kind of weird or whether it's like a little bit more traditional I love mm. it when we're talking about relationships you know and mm. how we are relating to each other the intramural mm. also mm. The refusal looks many many different ways I feel like elegance really hit the nail on the head um, and I think for me it, it often shifts with the project you know it really shifts like there's certain things that I'm going to keep for myself and the project I'm going to withhold certain imagery for you like for example in the Giverny document we are using the audio and very little of the visuals of a police encounter with Philando Castile. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, when they first see that, they're expecting to see a dead black body. Right. And we withhold, right? We withhold this dead or dying black or traumatized black body because this is, you know, something that we see very often. And I think in that refusal, the audience then has to do a certain type of work the kind of psychological and emotional work to fill in that gap, right? So there's a, a there's a, a, a way that abstraction is carrying some weight here and abstraction is not neutral. You have to, you know, use your subjective space to fill it in. Mm -hmm. um, but in that refusal, I'm engaging the audience. I'm asking the audience to come with me, you know. On well, that's so, but, I think that, but I think that's a sign of like a really talented artist because you spoke earlier about how you're, you're embodying your work with yourself and then now you're letting us know that you're you expect your audience to do that work with you and i think step that's right really on cool. in there. Yeah, yeah to step right in there with us so yeah refusal can look many many different ways but i think you really hit the nail on the head about being able to walk away from the table mm. if, if if love is not being served as nina simone would say right we get up from the table when love is not being served so if they're not meeting you where you need them to meet you right. we're not desperate you know, we know that our help comes from somewhere else and there'll be many, many, many more opportunities. So, you know, we can get up if there's no, if there's no dignity and integrity here, we can keep it moving. Um, so I think that that was a really, you know, that's something that, that folks coming up need to, need to understand as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want a third and fourth 
that sentiment and just trust that if you're doing the work, if you're engaged in serving your practice, your moment is going to come. Don't let anyone tell you that you have this season or this week mm -hmm. or this is an opportunity mm -hmm. um, and, and stay true and be willing to walk away. It is going don't, to And don't forget where you come from. Like the reason I know I can, I can validate myself and I don't need a studio or anybody to tell me who I am because I made peer kids with my credit card in my house, the camera I bought on a computer I owned, it took me 11 years to finish it. But mm -hmm. after going through that process, I know whatever is going on in my career, today, if they close the door on me tomorrow, I can go out and do it myself. And they know Period. that too. You know what Period. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So on That's that- That's being self-possessed me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Self-determination. Because oh, we could keep this going all night. Oh, why can't we? I gotta, I and we should, it. right? <laughs> um, thank you all so much for this conversation. It's been such thank a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Andrea. Yes, a real blessing. You. Yes, um, I, I see you over there girl, doing your thing. You better. Getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. it's a great way to spend a Thursday afternoon. Um, if you would like more information on our panelists and their films, their bios are avail available via the Eventbrite. And please keep up to date with Firelight and this Beyond Resilience series via Firelight's website, firelightmedia.org. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Firelight. Thank you, thank you, thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Have a great one, y'all. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Jean Jean-Pierre was in the comments going off.